Part 2. Break. If you're a fox, play the hare. If you're a hare, play the fox. Lorn our Argos. 12. Blood for blood. I stalk back into the gala. The golds have taken their seats, and formalities have begun in earnest. I am not subtle as I duck beneath a table and scrounge around on the ground to find the Pegasus pendant. I put it in my pocket, straighten my jacket, ignore the questioning glances, and move boldly away from Augustus's table toward the object of my interest. Pliny hisses my name. I pass him by. He knows nothing of what I have in store. I weave through the tables that seat the noble families, gathering eyes as a stone rolling down the mountain gathers snow. I feel them adding to my velocity. My gait is careless. My hands coiled with danger, like the muscles of a pit viper. Thousands watch me. Whispers form a cloak behind as they realize my target. He sits at his long table, surrounded by his family members. A perfect golden man, attentively listening to his sovereign speak. She preaches of unity. Order and tradition are paramount. No one rises yet to challenge me. Perhaps they don't understand. Or perhaps they feel the force of me now, and dare not to rise. The Bologna notice the whispers now, and they turn, almost as one. A family of fifty and more, to see me. A martial man, all in black. Young, untested in war. Unblooded beyond the halls of the Institute and the asteroids of the Academy. Some have reasoned me mad. Some have called me brave. Tonight, I'm both. The weight is gone. All the pressure I let crush me as I worried about expectations, as I gentle-footed around making a decision. All velocity, I tell myself. Don't freeze. Don't stop. Never stop. The sovereign's voice falters now. Too late to go back. I dive in. Smile. And the gala goes dead silent. As I spring thirty feet in low gravity and land hard on the Bologna table. Dishes crack. Servers scatter. Bologna's fall back. Some shout at me. Some do not move, even as their wine spills. The sovereign watches, struck by curiosity. Her fury is stirring at her side. Pliny looks about to die. He's gripping his knees in panic. Beside him, the jackal is as strange and unreadable as a lonely desert creature. I did not wear dress shoes tonight. My boots are thick and heavy. They crack the porcelain as I trod along the bologna table, shattering dishes of pudding and squishing tender steaks. My blood pumps through me. Intoxicating. I lift my voice. I'll have your attention. I crush a plate of peas underfoot. You may know me. There's nervous laughter. Of course they know me. They know everyone of worth though mine is more of rumor than substance. I see the Furies whispering to the Sovereign. See Tactus grinning his ass off. Carnus leans forward anxiously. Victorus smiling at the jackal. Even see Antonia nudging a tall, serene gold. I avoid looking at Mustang. Pliny gibbers in Augustus's ear. Augustus raises a hand to shut him up. Do I have your attention? I ask. Yes, I do. Boy, sit down, someone shouts. Make him, Tactus replies drunkenly. No, that's what I surmised. For those of you who do not know, I am a lancer of the House Augustus. For another hour or so, they laugh. I am the one they call the Reaper of Mars. 
who struck down a full peerless knight, who stormed Olympus and made the slaves of my proctors. My name is Darrow Ow Andromedus, and I have been wronged. We peerless scarred come from golden ancestors, from conquerors with spines of iron, honorable men, honorable women. But before you today, I see a family that is dishonorable. A family with spines made of chalk. A corrupt and fraudulent family. With liars and cowards that conspires to steal my master's governorship. Illegally. I crush a serving plate with my boots. Who knows if they conspire to do it or not. It sounds good. It seems like they conspire. And it's the mask I need them to wear. Carnus replies beautifully by whipping out his razor and surging toward me. His father, the Imperator, waves him back. Praetor Kellen looks about to grab my feet and jerk me down, where Cagney no doubt would cut my throat with my own razor. The younger girls of their family think me a demon. A demon that killed their cousin, brother. They have no idea what I really am. But perhaps Lady Bologna does. Cadaverous in her grief, she sits, surrounded by her brood like a withered lioness. They look to her as much as they look to her husband. The last thing I note is the trembling of her long right hand, as though it aches for a knife with which to cut me. Twice I have been wronged by this family. Once in the mud of the Institute, again at the Academy by that one. And this one. And that one. I point out all those who beat me in the garden. I see Cassius now, near the head of the table, just by his father and mother. Mustang sits beside him, her face a mask. Disappointed? Upset? Bored? When she quirks an eyebrow at me, I meet her eyes walk toward her and set my foot on the edge of the wine decanter that sits in front of Cassius. All eyes focus there, like lights falling into a black hole, pausing time, space, bending all forward, breaths catch. All courts of golden law permit a man to defend his honor against any force that would desecrate it unjustly. From the old lands of earth, to the icy bowels of Pluto. The right of challenge exists for any man and any woman. My name, gentle lords and ladies, is Darrow Ow Andromedus. My honor has been pissed on, and I demand satisfaction. I tip the wine over onto Cassius's lap. He explodes up at me. Goals all over the grand party burst up from their seats in a great roar. Tactus rushes from our table, joined with Leto, Victra, all of the aides and bannermen of the vassals to my arch governor, the Corvos, the Julii, the Voloxes, and huge Telemonuses. Pax's family. Razors snap into hands. Curses splinter the winter air. Aja, the largest and darkest of the Furies, leans down from the sovereign's table and bellows, Stop this madness! It's only begun. My hands shake like they used to in the mine. Now, as then, serpents surround me. You could never hear them, the pit vipers. Could rarely see them. Black as pupils, they slither in the shadows till they strike. But there's a fear that comes when they near. A fear separate from the rumbling of the drill. Separate from the throbbing, nauseating heat that builds in your balls as you carve through a million tons of rock and all the friction radiates up. Making a bog of piss and sweat inside your suit. It's fear in the coming of death, like a shadow has passed across your soul. The fear fills me now, as these peerless stand around me, a mass of serpentine gold, whispering, 
hissing, deadly as sin. Snow on the ground crunches under my heavy boots. I bend down as the sovereign speaks. She tells of honor and tradition, how marital dues mark the greatness of our race, so she makes an exception for the day. We may duel beyond the gaming grounds. This blood feud must be put to rest, here, now, in front of the August of our race. So confident is she in her newest Olympic night. But why wouldn't she be? He's killed me before. Unlike the cowards of old, we settle flesh to flesh, bone to bone, blood to blood. Vendettas die in the bleeding place. Virtute et armis, the sovereign recites. By valor and arms. No doubt she has already spoken to her advisors. They will say I am outmatched, that Cassius is a better swordsman. It never would have gone this far if she hadn't been assured a beneficial outcome. As it was with our ancestors, it is now and again to the death, she declares. Are there any contentions? I hoped for this. Neither Cassius nor I say a thing. Mustang steps forward to object, but the fury Aja shakes her head, stopping her. Then today... Res non verba. Actions, not words. I speak with my master before stepping into the center of the circle that now forms as Browns cart away the tables from the snowy plain. Pliny hovers beside Augustus, as do Leto, Tactus, Victra, and the great praetors of Mars. So many famous faces, so many warriors and politicians. The jackal stands farther away, shorter than the rest, impassive, speaking to no one. I wonder what he would say to me were there fewer ears to hear. He does not look angry. Perhaps he's learned to trust my plans. He nods his head, as if reading my thoughts. We are still allied. Is this a spectacle for me? For vanity? For love? Augustus asks as I stand before him. His eyes dig into me, trying to find meaning. I can't help but glance over at Mustang. Even now, she draws me from my task. You're so young, he nearly whispers. What they tell you in storybooks is wrong. Love does not survive things like this. Not the love of my daughter, at least. He pauses, reflecting. Her soul is like her mother's. I don't do it for love, my leash. No. No. I bow my head to him and remember Matteo's high lingo. The duty of the son is the father's glory, is it not? I fall to a knee. You are not my son. No. The Bologna killed him, stole him from you. Your firstborn son, Claudius, was all a man could hope for, a son better and wiser than his father. So let me make you a present of their favorite son's head. Enough quibbling. Enough of their politics. Blood for blood. My liege, Julian was one thing, but Cassius, Pliny tries. Augustus ignores him. I weep for your blessing, I say again, pressing my master. How long will you keep the sovereign's favor? A month? A year? Two? Soon she will replace you with the Bologna. Look how she favors Cassius. Look how she steals your child. Look how the other goes the way of a silver. Your heirs are depleted. Your time as arch-governor will end. Let it. For you are not a man fit to be arch-governor of Mars. You are a man fit to be king of it. His eyes flash. We have no kings. 
Because none have dared craft themselves a crown, I say. Let this be the first step. Spit in the sovereign's eye. Make me the sword of your family. I pull a knife from my boot and make a quick cut beneath my eye. The blood falls like teardrops. This is an old blessing. From the Iron Ancestors, the Conquerors, and it will chill those who see it. A relic of a bygone, harder age. It is a Mars blessing, one of iron and blood, of the raging ships that burn the famed Britannic armada above Earth's North Pole, and dash the fast killers from the land of the rising sun amid the asteroid belt. My master's eyes ignite like dormant coals breathed upon. Slowly, then all at once, I have him. I give my blessing freely. What you do, do in my honor. He leans toward me. Rise, Goldenborn. Rise, Iron Maid. Augustus touches his finger to the blood and then presses the mark beneath his own eye. Rise, man of Mars, and take with you my wrath. I rise to whispers. This is no simple squabble now between boys. It is a battle of houses, champion against champion. Hic sunt leonis, he says, tilting his head. Part challenge, part benediction. What a vain swine of a man. He knows my desperation to stay in his good graces. He knows he stands playing with matches on a powder keg, yet his eyes glitter lustfully, hungering for blood and the promise of power, as I hunger for air. Hic sunt leones, I echo. I pace back to the center of the circle, nodding to Tactus and Victra. They touch the handles of their razors, as do the other aides. Our pack mentality is keen. Prime luck, Tactus says. High above, ships swim quietly through the long night. Trees sway in the breeze. Cities sparkle in the distance. Earth hovers like a swollen moon as I unravel my razor from my forearm. Mustang comes to me as Cassius' mother kisses his forehead. So, you're a pawn now? She asks quickly. And your trophy? She flinches before her lips curl into a slight sneer. You say that to me? I don't even recognize you. Nor I you, Virginia, serving the sovereign now. But I do not recognize her. Despite the terrible gulf that now makes her feel more stranger than friend. The tightness in my chest is of her making. So too is the awkward tension in my hands as they yearn to touch her, yearn to hold her and tell her this is all a false guise. I'm not a pawn to her father. I'm more than that. All this is for good, just not their good. Virginia. She cocks her head at me, smiling sadly as she spares a glance for the two thousand waiting peerless. You know... I've wondered over these last years. I suppose I should have wondered from the start, but you cut such a rare character. It was distracting. But I'll ask now. Her bright eyes cut through me, searching, judging. Are you insane? I look over at Cassius. Are you? Jealousy, that's ripe. She leans in with a harsh whisper. Shame you don't respect me enough to suppose that I have my own plan. You think I'm here because my aching loins thrust me into Bologna arms? Please, I'm no bitch in heat. I protect my family by any means necessary. Who do you protect but yourself? You betray your family by being with him. I have no false answer that may parallel the truth. I must suffer being a villain in her eyes. Yet I can't meet them. Cassius is a wicked man. Grow up, Darrow. She looks like she's going to say something deeper. But she just shakes her head and turning says, He's going to kill you. 
I'll try to convince Octavia to end it early. Her words fail her at first. I wish you hadn't come to this moon. She leaves me, giving Cassius a squeeze on the hand, before joining the Sovereign's entourage on the raised days. Alone at last, my old friend, Cassius says, slashing me with a smile. Once we were like brothers. We shared food and raced that first day at the Institute. Stormed House Minerva together. How he laughed when I stole their cook and several their standard. We galloped over the plains that night underneath the light of twin moons. I remember the woe in his eye when they captured Quinn. When my kin, Titus, beat him and pissed on him. How I felt the tears welling then. When we were like brothers. Before it all fell apart. The cinnamon and orange-flavored snow still falls. It settles in his curly hair, on his broad shoulders. It was in the snow that he last fought me, buried rusty steel into my lower gut, and left me dying in my own filth. I have not forgotten how he twisted that blade to make sure the wound did not close. His blade is ebony now. It curls in front of him, over a meter of narrow sword when solid, more than two meters of lashing razor whip when loosed with the toggle on the handle, which sends a chemical impulse through the blade's molecular structure. Golden marks line the blade, telling the lineage of his family, their conquests, the triumphs thrown in their honor. Old, arrogant, powerful. My blade is naked, absent of embellishment. So, I have taken what's yours, he says, walking closer and nodding to Mustang. I laugh. She was never mine, and she's certainly not yours. The white arrives, hustling forward in his robes, head bald, back crooked. But I've had her in ways you haven't. His voice lowers so only we might hear. I wonder, do you lie alone at night, thinking of the pleasures I give her? Does it vex you that I know how she kisses, how she sighs when you touch her neck just so? I don't answer. That she moans my name instead of yours? He doesn't laugh. He may loathe what he says, but he'd say anything to hurt me. In most ways, he's not a bad man. He's just my bad man. In fact, she moaned as I went inside her this morning. What would Julian say if he could see you now? I ask. He'd echo mother and beg me to kill you. Or would he weep at the devil you've become? He uncoils his razor and ignites his ages. My own ages hums as I activate it, an ion bloom transparent energy shield that blows slightly outward from my left glove, one foot long by two feet wide. Snow melts when I sweep the ages near the ground. A corona of haze forms around the blue light. We're all devils. His sudden laugh floats up like a silk ribbon carried away with the breeze. This was always your problem, Darrow. You have an inflated view of yourself. You think you have some sort of morality tucked away. You think you're better than us, when really, you are less. Forever playing games you cannot master against people you cannot match. I matched Julian well enough. Bastard! His face contorts, and he lashes forward, bellowing wordlessly knocking me back before the white can give the benediction. They shout for us to stop, but as the razors scream, the shouts fade away, and all eyes widen as man-killing metal wails through slow-falling snow. He uses the tenets of cravat. Four seconds of precise kinetic violence. Retreat. Assess. Engage. We are the only sound in this strange place. The odd, high-pitched keen of an arching whip, 
the thrum of the solid blade, the crack as Aegis on left arms spark wide when blades slash into them, the crunch of the snow and the creaking of leather. Despite his anger, Cassius is perfect in his form. His feet shuffle, never crossing. His hips swivel as he lunges in the compact salvos. His breath comes measured, paced. He lashes his whip forward in a sweep, then hardens the blade and swings it up, aiming for my groin. His movements flicker fast, trained, honed by masters and swords of the society. It's easy to see why he has devastated his opponents since childhood, why he gutted me at the Institute. Because his enemies fight like him, but slower. I don't fight like them. I learned that lesson. Now, he will learn his. You've been practicing. You can match six moves a set, he says, drawing back. He darts forward, fainting high and sweeping low to claim my ankles. But you're still a novice. He sends a flurry of seven blows at me, almost skewering me through the right shoulder. I recognize the engagement pattern, but I'm still a fraction of his speed. I barely escape, throwing my way out of a thrust the last moment. Two more sets of seven come in quick succession. I barely escape the last, falling to a knee, panting, looking around at the gathered guests. Do you hear that? He asks. I hear nothing but the wind and the throbbing of my heart. That is the sound of dying alone. No one to weep. No one to care. Argos will care, I whisper. He stiffens. What did you say? Lorn our Argos will care if his last student dies, I say, dropping the falsely ragged breath, straightening proudly. Cassio stares at me as if he's seeing a ghost. He hesitates. So too do those who hear what I say. While you ate, I trained. While you drink, I trained. While you sought pleasure, I trained from the weeks after the Institute to the days before the Academy. Lorne or Arcos doesn't accept students, Cassius hisses. Not for thirty years. He made an exception. Liar. Oh, I laugh. Did you think I came here to be killed? Did you think yourself entitled to my life? No, Cassius. I came here to cut you down before your parents. He steps backward, eyes dancing to his father, to Carnus. I cock my head at him. Come now, brother. Don't you want to see how well I can really fight? He pauses, and I charge him like some night carnivore. Shoulders hunched with primeval economy, quiet as the dark itself. Lorne's words come back to me. A fool pulls the leaves. A brute chops the trunk. A sage digs the roots. And so I peel apart his legs, sending set after set into him. Not for the four seconds the golds teach, but for seven, then six, alternating, then breaking the pattern. Twelve moves a set. His defense is precise, and if I fought as he taught me to fight, I would die to him. But I was taught to move by my uncle and to kill by a legend. I rage and spin, leaving my feet and striking down, beating him as a great hurricane slapping and smashing and hammering him back. And when he attacks, I bow to the side until such time that I can break him as Lorne Arcos trained me to do. Move in a circle. Never retreat backward. No attack opens when a man allows himself to be pushed backward. Use their force to create new angles. Flow around him. The will away. Pretty. Fluid. Like a spring song in defense. Then lashing and horrible as the branches of a willow in deep winter as glacial winds scream down from the mountains. Inside me, red meets gold. My blade flashes between whip and curved sling blade. It crashes into a sword, and the aegis on his left side crackles from the force of my blows. 
Cassius falters. He's a prize fighter getting pummeled by a back alley brawler. I'm laughing, laughing madly, and the crowd around is cheering in shock. Some screaming when I hit Cassius' edge is so hard it overloads. Sparks hiss from the unit on his arm. I rip open a wound there, one on his elbow, his kneecap, his ankle. I flick the blade up and slash his face. I stop and move backward fluidly, posing with whip as it slithers into a curved sling blade. Those who watch this will never forget. Women are screaming for Cassius. Lovers he had had in his youth, who now watch the man they grew with. The man who bedded them, left them with false promises, and made them think they'd just lost the strongest of a generation. They watch as another man turns him into a throbbing mess of blood. I embarrass him. But it's all for a purpose. All to make that simmering hatred between Bologna and Augustus boil over into war. I pace about the circle like a caged lion, till I come in front of Imperator Bologna. Your son is going to die, I say savagely, a foot away from his face. He's thick, square-jawed, kindly, with a pointed beard. His eyes shimmer with the promise of tears. He says nothing. He is a noble man and he will follow the honorable path, even if it means watching his favorite son die. Even in the midst of my rage, I feel the shame, feel the horror of being the man who comes from the dark to savage a family. Will you just watch? I shout at the Bologna. Imperator Bologna's wife is not so noble. She seethes, glancing at the sovereign accusatorily. I see what she wants. I go back at Cassius. They will have to watch and do nothing. As I watched Eo. Lady Bologna, are you noble enough to watch your Cassius die? Watch as he disappears from the world. Her lips curl. She whispers to Carnus, to Cagney. Is that the strength of the house Bologna? Do you watch like sheep as the wolf comes among the fold? I make a grand show of it for the hot-blooded ones. Cassius tries to fight. He stumbles as I cut his kneecap, falling onto the snow before scrambling desperately to his feet. His blood makes a shadow in the snow. This is how slowly he killed Titus. He's panicked, glancing at his family, knowing it will be the last time he sees them. They have no veil. This life is their heaven. Despite everything, it is a sad sight, and I pity him. Cagney, urged on by Lady Bologna, has already taken a step forward, her sharp, pretty face riven with rage. I just need to hurt her strong cousin Cassius a little more. But Imperator Bologna jerks her back with a stern hand. He glares darkly at Augustus then peers around the assembly. No Bologna shall interfere. On my honor. Yet his wife does not agree. She aims one more pointed glance at the sovereign, and the sovereign raises a hand. Hold, she calls. Hold, Andromedus. I'm actually stunned by the interruption. All look to the sovereign's days. Cassius pants for breath. She can't be so stupid, can she? The interruption confirms the rumors for me, for everyone. The sovereign reveals her favoritism. She's chosen the Bologna family. They will supplant the Augustuses on Mars. Cassius would have been important to that plan. Now, because of her miscalculation, he's about to die and her plan is going to be squabbed. Still. I had no idea she'd do what she's about to do. It's so stupid. So short-sighted. Her pride has made her a fool. There has been an addendum to the rules. 
since the white was unable to give the customary benediction, the contest will be to death or yielding, she declares, glancing at Cassius's mother. Those are the limits to the duel. So many of our prized children are lost at our schools. No need to waste these two prime men on account of schoolyard pranks. My sovereign, Augustus calls, greedy for his bloody prize. The law is clear. Once a contest is declared, the rules may not be altered by man or woman. You cite laws. That's a pleasant irony coming from you, Nero. There are snickers from the crowd, which tell me rumors of his involvement with rigging the Institute for the Jackal are very much in fashion. My sovereign, we stand with Augustus in this matter, booms a voice. Daxo Altalamanus steps forward, Pax's elder brother, tall as my friend was, but less beastly, more a pine tree than a great boulder of a man. Like his father, Kavax, his head is bald, but engraved with golden angels. A mischievous sparkle dances in sleepy eyes, nestled under great swirling eyebrows. Hardly a surprise, snarls Cassius's mother. Perfidy! Kavax, Dagso's father, roars. He alternates stroking his forked red beard and the large pet foxy cradles in his left arm. This reeks of perfidy and favoritism. My temper is slow, but I find myself offended. Offended! Careful, Kavax, Octavia says icily. Some things cannot be unsaid. Why else would he say them? Daxo asks, glancing at families from the gas giants, where he knows he will find allies in the debate. But I believe he would counsel you now. My sovereign, even your words cannot change law. Your father discovered this by your own hand. No? The sovereign's fury stepped forward menacingly. For her part, the sovereign allows herself only the strictest of smiles. But, young Telemannus, you fail to remember. My word is law. This is something you do not do. A gold may rule other golds, but declare your rule at your own peril. The sovereign has been so long on the morning throne that she has forgotten this. Her words are not law. They now become a challenge, one I accept with open arms. She knows the words are a mistake when she meets my eyes, and we both realize in that moment there is one move I can make that she cannot counter. You will not steal what is mine, I growl. I will on Cassius. He brings up his blade. He never let me yield in the mode of the Institute. He knows I will not let him yield now. His face goes pale as I charge. He is thinking of all he's about to lose. How very precious his life is. A gold to the end. Others shout at me to stop, screaming that it's unfair. This is the definition of fairness. They would have left me to die. He lunges for my throat. It's a faint. He whips his razor down to wrap around my leg. He expects me to recoil. I charge straight at him, inside the arch of his swing, jump over his head in the low gravity, then swing my whip backward without looking. My whip coils around his extended right arm. I press the button that makes the razor contract. And with the sound of a frozen tree branch cracking in winter, I claim the sword arm of Cassius Albolona. It's equal parts silence and screams. I do not turn, not for a long moment. When I do, I find Cassius still standing, teetering, not long for this world. No one else moves as Cassius falls. His father looks at the ground, silent. I said stop, the sovereign shouts. 
two furies jump from the dais, landing with their blades dancing into hand. Finish it, Augustus commands. I stalk toward Cassius. He spits at me, lips trembling, contemptuous even now. I raise my blade, then a hand settles around my wrist. Not an iron grip, a soft one, warm against my skin. Delicate. You won, Darrow, Mustang says quietly, coming around in front of me so her eyes meet mine. The Furies pause outside the circle. Don't lose yourself to this. I could not imagine Eo watching me from the veil. In this hell, I've lost my faith. Mustang brings it sweeping back. Eo may watch me, or she may not. Only one thing is certain. Mustang watches me now. And what I see in her eyes is enough to let my hand fall to my side. It's then she smiles, as if seeing me again for the first time in years. There you are. Kill him! screams Cassius' mother. Kill him now! No! roars Imperator Bologna. Too late. Mustang's eyes widen. I turn in time to see the circle dissolve, crumbling inward as though it were made of sand. Not altogether, but tentatively. One Bologna sprints at me in silence. Low, deadly. Another follows. Then Tactus comes from the Augustus group. Then another Lancer. I hear my friend's war howl. A second echoes. There's more than just one gold present who was in my army. Cagnia Bologna is the first to meet me. My stolen blade rasps toward my neck. I duck. But I would have lost my head had Mustang not thrown up her own blade to deflect the slash. Sparks sting my face, and Tactus takes Cagney from the side, cutting her clean in half. Screams. The bleeding place collapses entirely. Golds of Bologna and Augusta sprint to protect their fellows. Others flee. Karna slashes at Tactus. Too much for my friend. I rush to his aid, saving him till Victra and others come between Karnas and us. Mustang is lost in the fray. I search frantically for her. A blade flashes at my head. Shouts boom as the sovereign calls for peace. But it is beyond her. A woman screams at Cagney's ruined body. Dozens of men and women, all with blades, slash into one another. Tactus tosses me the razor Cagney stole. Then he takes a blade through the shoulder, defending me again. I spend to my friend's aid and hack the arm off the Bologna man as he pulls his blade out of Tactus. I jerk my friend toward me, slashing a path clear. A blade scratches my forearm. I glimpse Mustang in the chaos, covering Cassius's wounded body. I don't know if the Bologna will kill her. They let her sit at the table. Still, I don't know. I rush toward her, throwing my weight into the bodies between us. Tactus helps. I smash into a woman, Antonia. Her eyes light up as she brings a knife up to my stomach, but Victra, her sister, punches her in the face, and Tactus starts kicking her in the head as she falls. Victra offers me a laughing smile until Carnus jerks her down by her hair. He's fought off as Leto enters the fray, turning back the tide with the precise thrusts of his rainbow razor. The Telemonicists join him, father and son decimating the goals who come before them with razors half the size of my body. Tactus, on me, I shout. Tactus is bleeding, but he's up and howling madly like he's still fighting beside several. Together, we jump high in this easy gravity. He knows I go for Mustang, but the blown are too thick, razors too deadly. Mustang, I shout, fending two Bologna's off. Slash away one's face and punch another in the throat with my aegis. Another joins them. And another. Till there's a thick Bologna bulwark blocking my path. Protect the Arch-Governor! Mustang shouts at me, voice more composed than my own. Making me feel an idiot obsessed with chivalry. Of course she does not need me to save her. Protect my father! And though I can't see her among the throng, I obey. 
I let Tactus jerk me away by the collar toward our retreating line, which is being assailed from the side. Someone else roars for us to protect Augustus. Others scream to defend Emperor Bologna and Cassius. Many family lords have been carried away by armed cadres of family members who back out of the chaos with their blades at the ready. They flee the spire, using the lifts to take them from the place, as grab boots were forbidden. It's nearly deserted. The Sovereign's Praetorians, purple and black clad obsidians and golds, cluster around and flyer from the ruined gala. Razors and pulse blades fill calloused hands. Greys come, led by golds and Praetorian purple to disperse us. They wear riot gear, and their scorchers shoot pain balls and scatter waves at the battling families, scattering the golds like summer flies. Augustus! Huge Carnus screams as he rushes from the Bologna ranks through the scatter waves like a madman. He knocks someone down with his shoulder, shatters the Lancer's face with his aegis, and charges headlong at Augustus, hoping to kill his family's rival in one fell swoop. Augustus! Leto, our best swordsman, and Augustus' ward, intercepts him in front of the arch governor. Hixod Leonis! He calls to the sky. Leto moves like the sea, fluid and terrible in his grace. He crashes Karnas back and is about to open him along the belly when suddenly he falters, freezes mid-swing. Karnas stumbles back, then straightens, perhaps confused that he's still alive. He cocks his head at Leto, who reaches for his thigh, as though stung. Leto sinks slowly to a knee, arms sluggish. His long hair tumbles over his face. Then he seems to freeze in place, suddenly motionless in the center of the chaos. Sad eyes glow with the engine plume of a passing ship as it coasts peacefully into the horizon. He is beautiful in that moment, before Carnus chops off his head. Leto! Augustus roars. His eyes widen and he pushes against the Telemannus men, who bear him away. I glimpse the jackal tucking his silver stylus into his sleeve, the one he spun on his fingers as he proposed our secret alliance. We lock eyes. He grins toothily. And I know I've made a deal with the devil.